1927, the newspapers were all about Charles Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic. Other headlines were about the TV being invented. They just invented it that year, but nobody had a TV yet. So the only way anybody could get their news is from a newspaper. And if something crazy happened in a local town, maybe like two hours away or within that time frame or so, I'm just making a guess there, people would actually drive to that town to see what was going on live. One of the biggest stories during 1927, though, alongside Charles Lindbergh and the television being invented, was the worst school massacre in history. And this happened long before Columbine or Sandy Hook. But before we get into this story, if you like twisted, dark, and mysterious true crime stories, I suggest slapping handcuffs on the subscribe button and taking it down to Chinatown. Also, be sure to click the subscribe button and click the little bell. This story starts with Andrew Philip Kehoe being born in 1872. Andrew was one of 13 kids. They used to have a lot of kids back then. Some would live, some would die. When Andrew was just 18 years old, his mom died. Andrew then went on to Michigan State University where he met a woman that he would marry about 20 years later. This woman that he's going to marry is the daughter of a wealthy family. Her name was Ellen Nellie Price. So for about the next 20 years, Andrew moves to a different area and works as an electrician. And everything is going well. This is how his life is going to be. He's just going to be a single guy, I guess, and just work as an electrician. And that's it. Until one day, he falls. He has a fall at work. And this fall causes him to go in and out of consciousness in a coma for several months. And when it's over, Andrew can't even work anymore. So he goes to live, he goes back to live with his dad. Now during this time while he was gone, living his life, being an electrician, remember his mom died when he was 18. So during this time his dad has remarried and Frankly, Andrew does not like this woman. She's much younger than his mom was, and uh, this woman and his dad have a daughter together. One day, his stepmom is lighting the oil oven in their house, and it explodes. And later on, people would say that they think that the stove had been tampered with, and that somebody wanted it to explode. So here's what happened next. When it exploded, oil went all over her body. She was covered in oil and she's on fire. Andrew is there and he grabs a bucket of water and douses her with it and she just goes way up in flames. So a lot of people think that Andrew planned that whole thing and killed his stepmother on purpose, but it was never proven. And Andrew moved away at that point his dad died a few years later. Andrew met back up with Nellie that he had met about 20 years earlier in college, and they got married. They moved to the Bath Township in Michigan. It's about 10 miles away from Lansing. And in fact, uh, her family is from Lansing. And so they bought a house. And at the time, this was 1911, this house was worth $336,000 in today's money. So I guess depending on what state you live in, that's, that's a pretty decent house. This house that they bought was on 185 acres and Andrew loved to work on this farm. Unfortunately, at some point, his wife, Nellie, got tuberculosis. And at the time, they didn't have any effective treatment or cure for tuberculosis. She was in and out of hospitals. Bath Township is only 31 square miles. And so as you can imagine, it doesn't have many people living in it. And they all know each other. And they know each other's business. Some of their neighbors described Andrew as being neat and clean. And if his shirt got dirty around, you know, before, like in the morning, 
he would go change his shirt. They said he was cruel to farm animals. One time he beat a horse to death because it didn't perform the way he expected. One time a dog ran onto Andrew and Nellie's property and Andrew shot and killed the dog. And the neighbor said it really, really was not necessary to kill that dog. They started going to church, but apparently the church had some type of parish assessment fee where you had to pay to go to church. I'm not sure, something like that. But Andrew wasn't having it. He didn't pay, he wasn't gonna pay the church anything. And he even stopped Nellie from going to church because he didn't want her paying the church either. This gave Andrew the reputation of being really thrifty. And it could be that one reason they moved to this town was because it still had rural schools. These are common schools and they originated back in England. And they are just supported by people in the community. There are no taxes raised. It's just a rural community school that they built so they can teach their children. The lack of school taxes could have been a reason for Andrew wanting to live in this area. But not long after they moved there, the town voted on getting rid of the rural schools and replacing them with a school district, a very small consolidated school district. And some benefits were that you could have um, the same curriculum across all of these students. Since Andrew had this reputation as, a, as being a tightwad, he was actually elected treasurer of the school board. Now this is a school that he does not want to have there and he does not want to pay these taxes for it. And now he's on the school board as the treasurer. So now they have this new school district and taxes have been implemented and Andrew is having to pay these taxes and he doesn't like it. And at the same time, he's been elected as treasurer of the school board. As treasurer of the school board, Andrew fought for lower taxes. He argued with board members. He voted against them when they ran. And if he did not get his way during a debate with another board member, he would call for an adjournment. He also accused the superintendent of financial mismanagement. And although Andrew was not being nice to the people he worked with, he was suddenly appointed the township clerk. This was in 1925. In 1926, they had an election for this position. And Andrew lost. And this seems to be something that humiliated Andrew it made him feel humiliated in front of everyone in that town. And he felt like he needed to get revenge. Bath School Board member M.W. Keyes was quoted by the New York Times as saying, I have no doubt that he made his plans last fall in 1926 to blow up the school. He was an experienced electrician and the board employed him in November to make some repairs on the school lighting system. He had ample opportunity then to plant the explosives and lay the wires for touching it off. Andrew stopped working at this time, and a neighbor worried that Andrew might be planning to do himself in. He also stopped paying mortgage payments. He stopped paying for homeowner's insurance, and the bank began foreclosure proceedings against their property. So from the mid-1926 in May when Andrew lost this election until the following August he was planning revenge on the whole town and it all had to do with this school that was built and the taxes that were implemented and the election that he lost so although he was not working at this time he was a busy man he began buying and allegedly stealing dynamite. He bought dynamite in different towns on a, and on different occasions so that people would not connect these purchases. He started experimenting with the dynamite on their 185 acre farm. One neighbor called him the dynamite farmer because he was always hearing explosions at this guy's farm. 
the day after Christmas in 1926, Andrew purchased a 30 caliber Winchester bolt action rifle. He filled his truck's back seat with shrapnel and dynamite. Then he began storing hundreds of pounds of dynamite in the north and south wings of the school. And he was able to do this because the school hired him for the whole month of November to do some work for them. And he had access to the building day and night, apparently. A woman would later say that she had seen a man carrying objects inside the school at night, on multiple nights. Unfortunately, she only mentioned this to a relative and they never told the police. Andrew was accused of stealing dynamite from a bridge construction site. When Andrew took dynamite into the basement of the school, he didn't just set it out in the open where it could be easily found. He concealed the dynamite inside pipes and bamboo shoots that he hid in the basement ceiling. He placed a container of gasoline in the school basement. It had a tube sticking out and he probably thought that the heat from the explosion would help ignite this barrel of gasoline. On May 16th of 1927, Nellie was released from the hospital, and it seems Andrew had just been waiting for her to get out of the hospital to carry out the next phase of his plan of revenge. First, Andrew killed his wife, and we're not sure how, but she was later found in a wheelbarrow charred. So she had been burned. Maybe she died in the house fire. Andrew placed homemade bombs inside the house and the other farm buildings. At 8.45 a.m. on May 18th of 1927, Andrew detonated the house and farm buildings. And right about the same time, set on a, an alarm clock, the school also exploded. Some neighbors saw the explosion of Andrew's house and ran to their farm to help. They crawled through a broken window, and when they were walking around the house trying to find Nellie, they found and removed dynamite that was sitting in a corner of the house. Andrew had tied the horse's legs together with wire so they could not run when the barn exploded. So while all this is going on, Andrew, meanwhile, has just jumped into his truck and he's heading, he's driving toward the school. On the way to the school, he passed a fire truck, and apparently at this time, you could just pull over your fire truck and chat with somebody when you were on your way to an emergency. He told them, boys, you are my friends. You better get out of here. You better go down to the school. They were headed to his house. On the way to the school, Andrew also passed a guy named Monty Ellsworth, who wrote a book about this disaster and Monty had just been at the school. He had heard the school explode and he ran to the school. When he got there, he found a pile of students on the ground. Some were dead, some were alive. Monty said, hey, I've got some rope at my house. I'm gonna drive home, I'm gonna grab the rope, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna tie it around these big brick walls and I'm gonna pull it off of these kids. That sounds crazy. I don't know if that's even realistic, but um, it was a crazy time and that was what he wanted to do. So he started driving toward his house and he passes Andrew Kehoe. Andrew's headed toward the school. Ellsworth said that Andrew grinned and waved his hand. And when he grinned, Ellsworth could see both rows of Andrew's teeth. So at the same time that his house blew up, over at the school, there was an alarm clock used as a detonation device. Fortunately, um, only one wing of or side of the school exploded. Andrew had set bombs at both ends of the school. One did not go off. If both had gone off, they said it was likely everybody in the whole building would have been killed. People who were there said this was like an earthquake. Everybody in town immediately knew that the school had exploded. The scene was chaotic and like a war zone. Some people who were heading to Kehoe's farm heard the school explosion and turned around and went to the school instead. Parents in the community heard the explosion and rushed to the school. 
Some women had so much adrenaline, they were able to lift huge chunks of bricks, like parts of brick walls, that grown men could not even be able to lift without something like a crowbar. When Kiho arrived at the school, he saw the superintendent who he had a grudge against and he tried to pull that guy over. He motioned for the guy to come over to his truck and then suddenly Kiho or Andrew shot into his truck that had dynamite and shrapnel inside of it and caused a huge explosion and it killed him and four other people including a little eight-year-old boy who had just survived the explosion in the building and was just walking out of the building and was hit by shrapnel from the from the truck. This shrapnel also severed the postmaster's leg. He didn't die right away, but he died just a short time later. All in all, this explosion killed 38 elementary children, six adults, and injured at least 58 other people. In response to this disaster, the whole town came together. The drugstore was turned into a triage center. Hundreds of people came from all around. All the contractors in the area sent their entire crews. These people worked all day and night looking for survivors in the pile of bricks and rubble. A local baker sent food to sustain everyone. National newspapers shared the story. Andrew was characterized as a maniac, a madman, and a fiend. There was no social media at this time. They didn't even have television. So after news got around the whole country, the United States on the news in the newspapers over a hundred thousand cars drove through this small town over the next few days some of these people were expressing their grief to survivors and many or all of them just really wanted to see the exploded buildings and just see the whole aftermath when they were rebuilding this school they found hidden dynamite on three different occasions Kehoe's body was claimed by his sister and buried in an unmarked grave his last words were found on a piece of wood that was stuck to a barbed wire fence, and they said, Criminals are made, not born.